I don't know how you guys felt when you first got saved and you first started going to church. I don't know if you felt like, oh, I get all this. This feels just like, you know. No, it was like, are you kidding me? It was like I just, I just landed on Mars or something. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, don't let them feel that way. Accept them. Love them. Invite them in. The eunuchs, they're already struggling. They have something that they consider that they are absolutely worthless. What good am I? That's what they come in with. They don't need to hear more sermons on how bad they are every week, quite frankly, because that just continues to feed something that Jesus says, no, no, don't let them think that way about themselves. They are my sons. In fact, I'll give them better names than sons and daughters. The Isaiah passage is so powerful. And now he gets to the temple and he knew what, this, he knew what it was going to be. This was not like, oh my goodness, what have they done? He gets there. He's been there before. For three years now he's been to the temple. And he sees the same nonsense all the time. But this time, because it'll be the last time, it'll be the last pound Sunday, so to speak, for Jesus. He clears it out, making it clear to every generation from that point on. It's not so much cluttering up your lives and preventing people from getting to God. I take it this way. I know I've heard people say, so you've got, you know, God wants you to clean up and get rid of all your sins and all that. I mean, I, I suppose that's true. I mean, I know it's true. But I'm not, I don't think I'm looking at a room full of people whose lives are filled with sin. But I'll tell you what it's possible to be filled with. Doctrines, traditions, and religion that gets in the way. It fills up the court of the Gentiles, and they can't get by that to actually get to a place of worshiping God. Because the temple, the whole thing about the temple was that it was a place of worship. It was supposed to demonstrate to us buildings are temples of worship. But now that Jesus has come on the scene, you are the temple of God. This is the place of worship. And I'll tell you what, that's the, that is what Jesus was trying to make so clear about the temple. It says it in a couple places. He's talking about his body when he talks about the temple. But the question for us, looking at this one little thing in Mark, for all nations, the question we need to ask ourselves, I need to ask myself, is there anything in my life or my lifestyle that's actually standing between God, and not me per se, but God wanting to use me for other people to worship him, to get to know him? And it's a question that, you know, we don't answer here tonight that we meditate on. I read a really neat old story that rabbis tell. I gotta find me some rabbis to hang around with, I think. Because they got great stories. <laughs> They're storytellers. Jesus was a storyteller. They tell a story about two brothers who lived together. They shared a farm, actually. And the one brother uh, was single. The other brother was married with seven children. So you have the two brothers working this farm with very different situations. One is single. One has tremendous responsibility with the family. And they work hard. As a result, God blesses them. They have harvests, and they would go out and harvest together. But the two brothers, each one had their own barn, and they would put their harvest into their own barn. Well, the single brother, after a few years, looked at it and thought, this really isn't right. My brother has a wife and seven children. There's only me, and we're splitting the harvest down the middle. But he's too proud of a man for me to recommend that I give him more. So at night, the single brother would go out and he would take a wheelbarrow and fill it with grain and go to his brother's barn and dump it in his brother's barn to give him more. That way his brother would think, wow, it's a miracle, my grain is multiplying. Well, the married brother was thinking about it and thought, you know, I've got seven children. When I get too old to work, my seven children are going to provide for me. But he's single. He's got no one. And when he gets too old, I'm not sure that he's going to have a lot enough to live on. So the married brother would go out in the middle of the night with his wheelbarrow and take grain from his, from his pile and bring it into the other barn, his brother's barn, the single brother. And they did this for years. So they always had the same amount of grain. But they always thought it was a miracle because they would take the grain from one barn to the other and then it would be back. Isn't that beautiful? Now, the best part of the story is this. One night, in the middle of the night, they pass each other with their wheelbarrows. And they meet each other and they just look at each other. They put down their wheelbarrows and they just hug each other and cry and laugh and cry and laugh and hug each other. And as the story is told, it's upon that spot that they built a temple for God. The rabbis got good stories. Mm -hmm. Let's move. In the garden, Mark 14, verses 32 through 38. 
And they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. He went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Would you read verses 51 and 52? A young man wearing nothing but a linen gar garment was following Jesus when they seized him. He fled naked, leaving his garment behind. So the picture is, you know, it is, it is a strange two verses, and Mark's the only one who records them, which is why people feel he was just inserting himself. And instead of being too self-centered about it, he doesn't tell us the whole story. People think a variety of things. They think that Mark, he was young. He was at home, was getting wind of what was going on, didn't get really dressed appropriately, whether he threw the bed linen around his body or whether he had type of pajamas that were a linen. We don't know. It's all conjecture. But he ran, he, he just ran to the garden. We're not looking at somebody who uh, was foolish in the sense. I mean, he was, but he wasn't. Foolish love, maybe. Just wanting to get to the place to see what's going on. But when you see how horrendous the garden was, I don't think we can really imagine what that was like. And what we get out of it, what I get out of this, is kind of like, it's, it's a very vivid picture to see them grabbing this linen cloth on this kid and ripping it off him and him running away. But let's take a step back 20 minutes. They came to arrest Jesus. In fact, Jesus even says to them in one of the Gospel accounts, you came for me, let the rest of them go. Leave them alone, you know. Your beef is with me, not with them. But it shows you the pitch of emotion, cruelty, and hatred in that garden because they would run over to a kid and grab him for no reason. In fact, they would have seen that he wasn't dressed in the kind of a garment that was appropriate, that they could rip it off of him. It's cruel. And Mark is saying, basically, if it's him or whoever it was, they ran away. Now, there's no sense looking at Mark, per se, if it is him. There's no sense looking at him and saying, well, he ran away. Well, they all ran away. In fact, if anything, I think this could even be Mark's way of saying, you know, to be honest with you, we all thought we knew what was happening. We were all dressed up for the occasion. We were wearing the wrong garment. It was easily ripped off. We were exposed at a time of fear. We were exposed who we really were, and we all ran away and deserted him. It just could be a statement of, of declaring the spiritual condition of all the disciples for that matter. I don't really want to major on that. What Mark really majors on, and you got to remember, I, I keep coming, I want to keep coming back to it, it's Peter who's telling Mark. Do you see all the words, the way he described what Jesus was going through? He was troubled, deeply distressed. He says to them, he's exceedingly sorrowful. He fell to the ground, and that Greek word does not imply like he decided to kneel. That he fell to the ground like any of us would literally fall, just the absolute anguish or whatever he was experiencing. And then he says something that I am so glad he says the way he says. He makes a declaration of faith. Father, all things are possible. Now I know that we all believe that, that all things are possible. The thing is this, we believe it, we know it, and then we get into a situation where it seems as though God could do this. Why didn't he? Surely this is a good thing, a right thing, whatever to do. See, Jesus says to him, all things are possible. He's talking to his father here. In fact, Abba, father, like a little child, like Ryan talking to you, Aaron. Daddy, Abba, I know you can do anything. In that case, he'd be wrong because as human beings, we can't do anything. But our Heavenly Father can. And he appeals to his Heavenly Father, Daddy, Daddy, all things are possible with you. Which means whatever's going on tonight with this whole redemption, atonement, sacrifice, all this, there's got to be an... I mean, it's possible you could do it another way where it's not going to cost, you know, me or anybody else. It's possible. I know it's possible because all things are possible. It's a powerful thought when you think about it because we, we all are in that kind of place where we get confused sometimes because we know all things are possible. God loves us. He can do it. He cares. We go on and on and on and on and on and on and they're all true and yet I'm facing something that's out of the box and I'm not 
I'm not asking him why. I don't even ask him why because I know he's, he's the all-wise God. But there is this sense of turmoil going on, of stress. I mean, let's face it, any stress that we experience in our lives is not because we don't think God can do anything about it. And it's not even a matter of we're even thinking about God. Any stress that we're experiencing is tension between what we would like, what we believe is right, and what's actually happening. This is crazy. Any stress that you're feeling currently about the amount of work you've got to do, it's very real. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of people whose careers, diplomas, courses, all kinds. It's a very real situation. And the tension is very real. What I want to say from Mark's Gospel, the word Gethsemane, I don't know if you know what it means, but it means an oil press. It's a place where they bring olives to be crushed so that they can get the oil out of it. And what Jesus is teaching us in Mark, Mark is the most vivid. If an olive could talk, I'm exceedingly sorrowful, deeply distressed, troubled. And I don't want to burst anybody's bubbles about Jesus. Because people say, well, you know, he was the Son of God and he knew what was going on. He was human. Mark put it beautifully last week. He was human. We are human. We get pressed. What do you do when you're being pressed? And Jesus is saying, pray, and then pray, and pray. And I'm telling you, the Spirit is willing to, to pray in this temple, at this altar. Remember, a temple is where altars are, which is a, which is a meeting place for God. And the spirit is willing. He's not stressed out. But the flesh feels the pressure. The flesh is like the outside of us, isn't it? It feels the pressure. But Jesus is assuring us, if you don't jump out of the oil press, if you don't run out of the garden, if you don't flee, what will come out, I promise you, as a result of prayer? Not the pressing, but the prayer is an oil. And olive oil was used in a number of different ways applications, healing, to rub on their face when they were in mourning, a variety of things. In Mark's garden, we see a crushing going on. But like Paul says, you know, we're pressed, but not defeated. We all know pressure. And Jesus, I'm with you. I know pressure too. Let's finish it up with Mark 15 and then... Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who is himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoned the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. He laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon, or Salome, brought sp him spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said amongst themselves, Who will roll away the stone? from the door of the tomb for us. And when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. And he said to you, so they went So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, I've said it before, uh, you may have been here or maybe not missed it or whatever. Mark's Gospel goes on from there for another 12 verses. The original manuscript of Mark, Mark's Gospel ended with that verse, which is why we ended there. And then at some future point, after Matthew... Luke was written, Mark's Gospel was added to by somebody. It doesn't conflict with anything. It just agrees with the other Gospels. It's like somebody said, you know what? This is a terrible ending. I mean, it leaves them afraid. They were in fear. You can't leave it like that. And so they just tacked on another 12 verses so that it all fit together more nicely. I feel bad about that because, again, this is the first Gospel that was written, and I think that Peter dictating to Mark, was leaving us, everybody, exactly where we should be left, kind of. In other words, he's being downright honest about it. He's saying, listen, these are the things that happened. This is the story of Jesus. But even us, when this thing on Resurrection Sunday, we hadn't seen Jesus yet. We had just heard 
and we're told to go tell. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Did you notice how it said, tell the disciples, including Peter? I don't know if you noticed that when you read it. It's kind of funny, because Peter is dictating it to Mark and saying, you know, this is what happened, including Peter, which is not an arrogant statement. It's a beautiful statement. Remember, Mark doesn't talk about the fire in John 21. Peter, do you love me? So Peter, for Peter, at the end of Mark, this is his way of saying, Jesus loved me. He included me. I denied him that night, repeatedly. When he needed me the most, I denied him, even knowing him. I swore, I yelled, I screamed. I hope that's an encouragement to you, because we do get a bit, we wonder at times what on earth is going on. Anyway, I like the fact that it ends the way it ends. They are walking this thing out. They're not standing there in fear. They're moving to go tell the disciples what they've just been commissioned to say. But they are scared. And I think that's a pretty good human condition in the sense that they were very real and the Gospels are very real. This is not, you know, fantasy. These are real people who were really scared because they really crucified somebody. And if you identified with that person, you were probably going to end up on a cross someplace, as Peter does eventually. I'll tell you what I, what I also like very... It's not just in Mark, it's in all the Gospels. And I'll kind of end with this, I think. Jesus worked really hard at what Paul ended up really grasping. There is neither male nor female. But <coughs> Judaism being patriarchal was dying a very hard, slow death. Jesus goes out of his way to not see male or female. He makes sure that there's an understanding, whether it's the woman at the well, whether, you know, whoever it is. Jesus is the greatest woman's liberator that ever lived. He put us all on the same pitch. But when you hear the commission, the great commissioning, always preached and talked about, who is it to? Every time. It's either in Matthew 28, to the disciples, in John 20, in the upper room, to the disciples. And here's the first commissioning to these three ladies. When you read it, go and tell. That's the commissioning. Go and tell to these three ladies. We never refer to that as a great commissioning. It's just three ladies who actually, when you read the whole story in Mark, never really took their eyes off Jesus. It talks about them being at the cross. It talks about them watching as Joseph of Arimathea took them off the cross, put them in a tomb, being at the tomb, watching as they put them in the tomb so they knew just what tomb to go to. Something that we may not realize, because it may sound funny, like, well, how come Joseph of, of Arimathea could roll the stone, but when it came time to roll it away, it, you know, it was such a monumental task. It doesn't make any sense. If a guy could roll it one way, you just roll it the other way. But the way the tombs were built and the way the stone was, it was on an angle, like on a hill. So it was, much, it was easy to roll down to cover up the tomb. To get that stone away, you had to push it uphill. And it was no easy trick. Besides the fact that who touches a Roman, you know, because it would have had a Roman seal over it. Who would remove the Roman seal? That's a death sentence. And who would roll away the stone? It, it says that they were astonished. Astounded is what, is what was happening. And you read through, you know, the guy in the tomb and the whole thing. It was like, what? John's, or Mark's gospel really ends, I think, I guess I see the beauty in it. Because every one of us who has ever had an experience like what they were having of being faced with something that boggles your mind and yet you know it's true and it's real and fear starts to set in, there is a future. You had mentioned to me a couple weeks ago you guys were someplace and a lady behind the counter, something happened and you wanted to pray for her and then you didn't. And there's only one reason why. And God's saying you have a future. That may happen ten more times. I may be someplace where I'm feeling prompted to pray, but for whatever reason, I don't. I felt like an idiot the day that the police officer, I asked if I could pray for him, and he said no. Part of me was looking at him, feeling like he was an idiot. The other part of me was what an idiot I am. And those kind of feelings that, that we feel sometimes, and then fear is right there to say, well, you are a bit of an idiot, and I'm not. I'm a man of God who cares about the people around me, and I wanted to pray for the guy. But all I'm saying is that could have easily put me off next time I saw a police officer, in fact, the man of God that I was with was almost like, oh, I bet that's the last time you do that. I said, no, that just fuels me now. <laughs> that's just like putting fuel on a fire. You know? And that is really, I, I was fighting off feelings of inadequacy, fear, all, everything you can think of, because that was not a future. There's no future in that. And what I'm saying is to any of us in that situation, Mark's Gospel is saying, you've got a future. That's what he's saying. He leaves it in the place where we know that's not the end, but it is real. 
It's just not really the end. He hands it to us. He says, now here you go. You've been given all this information. You're human. You've got the same thing that we had. What do you think? And he hands it to us. And he says, go. Go with it. I say, well, I'm like, yeah, it's all right. Go with it. You've got a future. Go with it. But the way Mark has written to the Romans in his Roman name, with a Roman kind of approach, with a statement from Isaiah for all nations, he's telling us something else about how to go forward.